This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston in our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. so glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you. We do that through the connection card. You can get the physical one at the Welcome Center. And then if you fill it out with the little pen that we gift you, uh, and then just redeem it at the Welcome Center, we'll give you a gift here. And then you'll also get a little gift in the mail. One quick announcement. Our 10th anniversary party is October 9th, Saturday at 4 p.m. Everybody who loves this church is invited. Everybody who loves this church. I've been getting a little sentimental recently. It might be because I'm getting older. It might be because I have a 13-year-old. As of this week, my oldest daughter, Sophia, she turned 13. And we celebrated her birthday. And it hit me in a... It hit me in a new way, because she was nine months old when we moved to the city. She's more Bostonian than most of you. Raise your hand if you've been in the city longer than 12 years and three months. Oh, tremendous. It's like seven of you. It's all to say, you should come to the birthday party. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be catered, it'll be a meal, dress nicely. Uh, we will praise God for all of his blessings to date, and we will cast a vision for the next season of Mosaic. In the next season of Mosaic, we don't just want attenders or congregants. We need builders to build the church a building. I'm praying for our own space. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for no more set up and tear down. I'm praying for chairs more comfortable than these. I'm praying for climate control. I'm praying for being rooted in the community, not for the next 10 years, but for the next century. That's what I'm praying about. So you should come. Uh, RSVP. Go to brookline.mosaicboston.com backslash worship nights to RSVP. Okay? With that said, would you please pray with me over the preaching of God's word? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, the great God of the universe, breathed everything into existence through the word of God, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, you are word and you took on flesh. And you, the word of God in flesh, empowered by the Spirit, you lived the greatest life ever lived. And then you, Word of God, author of life, were crucified. Our sins killed the author of life. We pray, Holy Spirit, come now and show us that apart from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we're lost. We're lost. And we need you to save us. I pray we never forget that. I pray we never forget that we need to be saved. We can't do it on our own, but we know who can. I pray, Holy Spirit, bless our time in the Holy Scriptures now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going through a sermon series through 2 Corinthians that we're calling Prodigal Church. This is season two. Season one is online. The title of the sermon is God the Writer. This week, comedian Norm McDonald passed away from cancer. I'm not sure if he was a believer. People close to him say he was. A few years ago, he tweeted the following, Scripture, faith, grace, Christ, glory of God. Smart men say nothing is a miracle, I say everything is. And I like that perspective on life. Some look around, they say, where's God? Nothing's a miracle. And some who have eyes to see realize that absolutely everything is 
a miracle. And surprised by joy, C.S. Lewis desp- describing his conversion as he, he thought he was seeking God and he didn't understand that God was actually pursuing him, hounding him. He called him the hound of heaven. And C.S. Lewis, a writer, he says, I could not more meet him, God, than Hamlet could meet Shakespeare. And that's a really compelling illustration that Hamlet could explore his world without finding evidence, any evidence of the author, Shakespeare, not in outer space, not behind a tree, not submerged in the depth of the ocean. In another sense, Hamlet wouldn't exist without Shakespeare. Nothing in his world would exist without the author. We should see evidence of the author all around us, but we don't. We, th- we think that we're the point of the story. And for Hamlet to know Shakespeare personally, the author would have to write himself into the story to show him, hey, Hamlet, you're not the hero of the story because I made you. You're not the hero. You're not the author. And you're not free to write your story any way you want because you're just words on my paper coming from my pen. Lewis later says, Hamlet could initiate nothing. For the two to meet, it must be Shakespeare's doing. The author would have to write himself into the story. And this is the claim at the foundation of the Christian faith, that there is an author to our story, to our world. And the only way to meet him is not of your own initiation, not of your own logic and intellect and cognitive abilities. The only way to meet him, he must act. He must write himself into human history, and he has. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And the author entered the plot And he did it to rewrite our stories into his story. And his story is actually the best part of history. The greatest story ever. The good news written by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. God has a book on every single one of us. And he writes our days. He writes our days as the best that we could be, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, there are days that you live and you're like, today was a good day. And not just because you live for yourself. There are days where you just pour yourself out. You pour yourself out. The Holy Spirit fills you and you just keep doing it again. That's what we're talking about today in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Would you look at the text with me? Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face, Because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope... We are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted 
Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed to the image from one degree, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the reading of God's holy and errant, fallible, authoritative word. May you write these eternal truths upon our hearts. Three points. Number one, you aren't the hero of your story. Number two, you can't please God without faith. And number three, you can't free yourself. I've realized uh, recently that I'm kind of an, uh, you know there's motivational speakers out there. People pay a lot of money to go see, like Tony Robbins. People pay a lot of money. I'm kind of an anti-motivational speaker. Like you show up and I, I just tell you, you need Jesus. That's, that's what I'm telling you. That's, when, that's the point. So first of all, you aren't the hero of the story. 2 Corinthians 2.17, St. Paul started the thought that he continues in chapter 3, verse 1. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. St. Paul said, God commissioned me. God commissioned me. I didn't enlist. A lot of Christians don't understand the Christian life because they think that they enlisted. And you're like, I chose this. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You were drafted. God chose you. You were drafted into the army of God, into the family of God. You were adopted. Same metaphor. God commissioned me. And, and the, the response that they might say, oh, you're being so proud. You're saying God singled you out. And he's like, no, I didn't choose this. He says, we're men of sincerity. And his critics would say, are you being proud of your sincerity? Oh, Paul's commending himself again. What they didn't understand is the difference between self-confidence and God-confidence. And if you don't know the difference and you meet someone who is rooted in God, confident in God, you're like, I have never seen that before, but the closest that I've seen that is this is a really proud person. St. Paul says, no. No. It's not me. It's not my power. It's not my word. It's not my message. It's not my Holy Spirit. I'm confident in God. And that's verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? And do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. So St. Paul started this church. Uh, he spent 18 months with these people, loved these people, knew these people. They knew him. And they became Christians. He, 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 he was the midwife of them coming to life. He saw the new birth in them. He, was, he saw them regenerate as he proclaimed the gospel. He loves them intimately. They are the letter of recommendation. Why even bring this in? Because he, had, he left the church and then critics came in and said, Who's St. Paul? Who's, who's the apostle? Who's that guy? Look at my letters of recommendation. I, I, I know what my credentials are. What are Paul's credentials? And Paul, is, he's not saying that uh, the letters of recommendation are wrong because he wrote letters of recommendation himself, commending Timothy in 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians, Phoebe in Romans 16, Timothy and Epaphroditus together in Philippians. The book of Philemon itself is a letter of recommendation. But he says, do, you, do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation from you? Do we need it? They clearly need it. Because they're from the outside. They're peddlers of God's word with shady characters who use and abuse these letters. The same people demanding letters from St. Paul never got letters from him. They just saw an opportunity. He left. They came in. Paul's point is such letters would be ridiculous because you would not be the church apart from... That's what he's saying, St. Paul. You would not be the church apart from me. That's what he's saying. You know my calling. You know my anointing. You know my divine commissioning. Authority is a preacher of the gospel because you're believers. You know that the Spirit is working through me, he's saying, because you have felt it. And he says, you're written on our hearts. You are our living, breathing letters written in the most interior, secret dimension of his being. You are... Living validations of my calling and ministry, he says. Verse 3, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. You're written on our hearts. You yourselves are a letter. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. He says, you are our letter. I didn't write you, he's saying. 
I didn't write your letter. I didn't write your story. I'm just the mailman. You are a letter from Christ written by the Holy Spirit of God. You're written on my heart. But you are a letter. I'm just delivering that letter. Christ is the author. The Holy Spirit inspires. St. Paul was used. God wrote the Ten Commandment tablets the first time with his finger, Scripture says. With his finger. And the same God with the same fingers, metaphorically speaking, is writing on the tablets of our human hearts. And just, just take a step. By the way... This may be the most dense chapter I have ever preached in my whole life. I wasn't done with this. I thought I was done yesterday at 4 p.m. And then I realized I wasn't. And I wrote till 9.30 p.m. Completely rewrote sections of the sermon. Because I realized I didn't get what was going on. Because this is the, the way St. Paul, he just goes level by level by level, dimension by dimension, dimension. See, here I'm just going to pause every once in a while as I get too deep. We're going to come up for a, fresh, for a breath of fresh air, and then we'll dive back down. So a breath of fresh air. Speaking of Christ writing stories, have you ever written your story? Have you ever sat down and written your story? Autobiography. That's a, that's a compelling thought. I, I was meditating on that today. I was like, how honest would I be? How honest could I get about my story knowing that everybody would read it? How honest could I get? From here on out, and, and, and I, that's trippy because we know there's parts in our lives that you're like, ah, I can't mention that or that or that because I got kids and they might read my book. <laughs> but that's an, an incredible thought experiment because you can you can kind of reverse engineer the life you want to live. Like from here on out, if you wrote an autobiography about what you want your, your life to be. This is the life I want to live, the life I want to be remembered for, the things I want to accomplish from here on out. You can write that down right now and work toward it to be remembered for the things that you want to be remembered for. But then as you write that story, Here's a question. Who's the hero of that story? Who's the hero of your autobiography? Is it Jesus Christ? If not, if not, we've got to reassess some things. Who's the hero of your story? And I say that because God is the one who created you. Right? God is the great author who created you. He fashioned the character and the personality that you are. He created you just to make the world a little more interesting. Like if I were writing a book, and you, you, want, you want a book with interesting, compelling characters. He created you to add value to the whole story. You make the story better. You make the story more exciting. You make the story more entertaining. But when you make it about you... That's when you lose everybody. Th because that's demonic. Because that's what Satan did. The greatest character that God ever invented, with the most abilities, the most handsome, th probably the funniest, the sharpest wit, the most strength, was Satan. He was number two. And then Satan was such a compelling character that he confused himself. He thought that he was God. He thought he was the hero of the story. So who's the hero of your story? Your life is a letter. It's a chapter in the book that God is writing. And people are reading your life now, and what are they reading? I'm telling you, uh, uh, Pastor Shane, Pastor Andy, and I were thinking about what we're going to do for the sermon series for the fall. And we're like, you know what? I think there's a theology of adventure in the Bible. There's a theology of adventure. Because the lives that people lived, the, the people that got into the Bible lived incredibly fascinating lives. I couldn't think of one boring person that made it into the Bible. Can you think of one? A lot, maybe. But even then, he's like an anti-character and you're like, ah. No, I, I, could, I can't think of one. I can't think of one boring person. So, so the point is, we don't have to go to adventure, theology, but let's just read the Bible. 
Paul lived a fascinating life. Fascinating, interesting, exciting. I heard one preacher say, he said, if your sermon is boring, you're sinning. Because you take the greatest story that ever was and you can't even tell that story. That's the greatest story ever. The trippiest, like, you can't even think of, like, any story that actually is, like, worth listening to. It always copies from the Bible. It's just plagiarism all the time. Like a hero dying for everybody and then dies and then comes back from the dead. It's a oh, cliche. They stole it from Jesus. It's plagiarism. So my question for you is, is your life boring? Is your life boring? Like if you documented your week this past week, is it even watchable? <laughs> is, is that episode of this, or the past month, is that episode even watchable? Can you sit back and be like, you know what, there were some pretty good parts in this past month. Is it even watchable? And as you watch it, who's the hero of the story? That's what I, I want you to wrestle with that. Is Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis the hero of my story? Where people look at my life and they're like, how did you do that? Why did you even accomplish that? Why did you say that? Where did you get that little nugget of wisdom? That relationship, that service to someone, that generosity. That's what makes that, that's what touches the heart. Do you do that? Do you live a life from the heart? A life worth living? Jesus is the hero of of the story. That's what St. Paul is saying. And then he continues and he says, look, you can't please God without faith. You can't please God without faith. So, so you're not the hero of your story. And you also can't please God without faith. And I'm going back to the same metaphor I, I used in the very beginning, that God is the author. God, right, Shakespeare, Hamlet, that whole thing. So you can't understand life unless you understand that you're not the author. In, in order to understand that God is the author, he's the one that's writing on our hearts, writing the story of our lives. You need to believe. There's no other way. You need to believe that he is the author and you are not. Hebrews 11:16. 16, and without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So St. Paul, he was talking about, look, I don't need letters of recommendation, your letters of recommendation, your letters, et cetera, et cetera. And then now he's talking about confidence. Verse 4, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. The confidence that we have is that you are believers because the Holy Spirit flowed through us. The Holy Spirit made you Christians. You are our letter of recommendations. You're written on our hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. But our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Confidence in God is one thing. St. Paul is like, oh, we have confidence in God. But he immediately renounces self-sufficiency. Our sufficiency is from God. God used us, but it wasn't us. I'm just a vessel. God used us, but it wasn't us. The message isn't us, the power isn't ours. None of it is ours. Our sufficiency is from God. I'm confident, he says, such is the confidence, I'm confident that I can't do anything. Jesus Christ said you can't do anything apart from me. I'm confident that I can't do anything. I can't do jack diddly squat. I said that to one of my daughters, and they're like, ooh, I've never heard that term. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I've got to edit that out of my story. I can't do a thing. That's what he's saying. I can't do it, but I know the one who can. God can. I'm confident I can, but God can. And with fine irony, Paul asserts his confidence is rooted in personal inadequacy. The reason I have confidence is because I can't. This is, the, I'm telling you, this is one of the trippiest things. If you learn this truth, it will transform how you live your life. You're going to walk into any room like Conor McGregor doing the, billy, the billionaire walk. And they're like, you're so proud. And they're like, nope. I'm with the one who is glorious. There's a, like, it's a humble confidence. That, that's what I'm saying, the humble confidence. He asserts his confidence is rooted in personal inadequacy. Just like Moses. 
God calls Moses. Moses killed a guy, and then he's in the wilderness for 40 years, and then God says, okay, from the burning bush, he said, come, you're in the holy ground, take off your shoes, etc." And And God's like, you're going to go into Egypt, and you're going to take my people out, et cetera, et cetera. And Moses said, I can't even talk. Can't even talk. He had a stutter. He had a, he had a, a, a speech disability. He said, I can't even do it. And God's like, that's why I chose you to be my mouthpiece. Same thing with Gideon. You see this all throughout Scripture. Insufficiency, human insufficiency, divine sufficiency. Gideon, Lord, please pick anybody else. I am the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. And God tells him, I'm going to be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. God, I can't do it. God's like, that's why I chose you. Isaiah, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Amongst the people with unclean lips, God's like, finally, you got it. I chose you because you have a dirty mouth, so to speak. And then God cleans his mouth with a coal. Jeremiah, Lord, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. And Lord, the Lord said, whatever I command you, you shall speak. Ezekiel had an innate sense of insufficiency, remedied with vision, a glory of God. He saw God. A lot of you aren't used by God even like you're not even at 10% of the capacity that God has for you. You're not even at 10% because you are so capable. You're so capable in your lives. You're so gifted. You're so talented that you can just, you don't even have to really try. The problem is when you apply that to Christianity, that I can do it, everything's easy for me, you lose the power of God. And then you are not used by God to your full potential. Oswald Chambers said, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen to use nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. He chose to use somebodies only when they renounce dependence Dependence on their natural abilities and resources. I wonder if you have. I wonder if you've renounced your abilities, your credentials, your resume, your accomplishments. And I, I, like, this is real talk. You got to do it on a daily basis. Like you crushed it yesterday, and then you get up. You got to be like, I haven't done a thing. I can't do a thing. I need God, I need you. And then St. Paul moves from that, this idea that I can't but God can when I fully rely on him. My confidence is rooted in my inadequacy. This, from here, he launches into, that's the point of the whole Bible. That's the next section. That's the point of the whole Bible. And, And everyone reads the Bible either through the lens, this is what God told me to do, and I, I'm gonna do it. And I'm going to show, I'm going to prove to God that I am worthy of his love, acceptance into heaven. That's one way of reading. The other way of reading the Holy Scripture is, I can't do it. I read the Ten Commandments and I can't do one of them apart from the Holy Spirit. So the old covenant is self-sufficiency. I can do it apart from God. Paul says, I'm a minister of the new covenant. And the occasion, and he quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. That's where the idea of the new covenant comes from. The occasion is the reign of Josiah in 600 BC. When after rediscovery of the law, there was a time of national repentance. And the people made a public covenant with God. And then they failed immediately. They said, we're going to do it. We're going to obey. We messed up that time. This time we're going to fix it. We're going to try a lot harder. They failed immediately, and then God promised a new covenant. The old covenant, just to summarize, the old covenant is you can do it. You can do it. Here's the law. Here's God's will for you. You can do it. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is no, you can't. Jesus did, and now by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. Old covenant, you can do it. New covenant, you can't. Jesus did, now you you can with the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. 
and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is real salvation. This is real new life. This is real forgiveness. This is real faith. As opposed to thinking you're part of the family of God because of your DNA. That's what Israel thought. We're born into the people of Israel. Of course we believe in God. They were circumcised, religious, offering sacrifices prescribed by God's law. They weren't personally saved. They didn't have a relationship. They didn't know God. They knew about God. They had words about God, but they forgot about the spirit of God. They weren't saved. They didn't have a living faith. They were circumcised outright, but there was no inner circumcision of the heart. So St. Paul is saying the old covenant is external. It's the things you do for God. The new covenant is internal. It gives you a new heart, and he gives you new power source, and that's the Holy Spirit, as promised in Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That was the problem with the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was God's Word, but they forgot God's Spirit that actually inspired that Word. So 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11, St. Paul continues, If the ministry of death carved into letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Pause, pause. Okay, we deep dive. <laughs> Let's come on. This is what I was, I was thinking about this week. A lot of you listen to sermons like editors. I, and I can tell by your eyes. Like parts of my story, you're like, nope, I'd get rid of that part. I'd include something else. I'd include a little story here. That didn't slap. This will slap. You know, you, you listen. Because I do that. That's how I listen. I listen like an editor. I want you to listen to this sermon like a writer. If you were writing a sermon on this text, what would you say? Well, if you, it, and by the way, <laughs> this is next level. But that's how you actually learn to study the Bible. If you study the Bible like an editor, uh, oh, I didn't like that part. Oh, didn't like that. Uh, that book, just get rid of that whole book. You got to, you got to, if you want to know what scripture means, you got to read it like a writer. Holy Spirit wrote it. I don't, I can't edit it. So I need to receive it. It's, it's a different way of, so Okay. What's St. Paul doing here? Many have interpreted this text and this chapter the following way. That St. Paul looks at his ministry and he says, my ministry is far superior than that of Moses. Moses was old covenant. That's old news. That's antiquated. That's what the false religious teachers are teaching you. And he ties them to Moses' false, uh, antiquated covenant. And my ministry is far more superior. That's how many old covenant is time chronological. Jesus comes okay, and a, a lot of uh, in other languages like in Russian, in my Russian Bible, this is the way it was interpreted because testament, the word for testament is actually covenant. Vietchi Zaviet is covenant. Novi Zaviet is covenant, but it's testament. So a lot of people think, okay, the, the old books, the old testament, that's old news. Now we have the new testament. The, the reason that interpretation is so dangerous is because Christians just get rid of the Old Testament. The Old Testament means nothing to them. The Old Testament God was just mean. The New Testament God, Jesus is nicer. I like Jesus. He pats me on the head. The Old Testament God throws rocks from heavens at his enemies. And I want to submit to you that's not what St. Paul is doing here. He's not contrasting his ministry with the inferior, quote unquote, ministry of Moses in the Old Testament. Is he contrasting his superior ministry with Moses' inferior? No, he's not doing that. 
He's not saying that's outdated. This is now the, the good news. And you, he's not doing that. What he's doing is he's saying the old covenant was missing the Holy Spirit because they intentionally divorced themselves from the Holy Spirit. They divorced themselves from God. So they lost the point. That's why they, fo they focus on the letter instead of the spirit. Read any of Paul's letters, any of his teaching. He never says Moses' ministry or his message was inferior. Hebrews actually says that what Moses preached was the gospel. It was good news. Look at Hebrews 3, 16, 17. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of what? What's the key word? Because of what? They didn't enter not because of disobedience, but because of what? Disbelief. This, they were missing faith. Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news, gospel, for good news came to us just as to them. Same message. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter the rest as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then verse 6, Hebrews 4, Since therefore it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long after, and the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The reason why they need a new covenant with a heart transplant is because they refused to believe, so their hearts were hardened. Moses' message was the same as Paul's message. Moses, before he comes, Moses with the Ten Commandments. Moses with the Ten Commandments. He gives it to the people. He, before he gives the Ten Commandments, he says, hey everyone, remember that thing we just lived through where God brought us out of Egypt? He saved us, freed us from captivity. We now have a relationship with God. Let's believe in him. He saved us. Now here's the law. That's just like the New Testament. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saved you. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It's the same message. God saved us. Now love him. Now obey him. Paul explicitly says this in Romans 10 as he quotes Deuteronomy 30. In Romans 10, verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring Christ down, who will descend into the abyss, that is, bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Now he quotes Deuteronomy. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. The word is in your heart. Did they have the Holy Spirit? Not in the same way that we do after the day of Pentecost, but did they have the Holy Spirit? They had the Holy Scriptures. Well, who wrote the Holy Scriptures? The Holy Spirit. If they got more of the word of God in their hearts, that's what he's saying. Get it in your heart and believe it. That is the word, the Lord, that is the word of faith that we proclaim you're supposed to believe. They were supposed to believe. They didn't believe. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. If you don't know where you stand with God, this is all it takes. Confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ, you are Lord, and I believe that you rose from the dead. That's it. You confess that and you're saved. That's it. That's the whole message. But let me just boil it down. The whole thing. Let me just give you the whole thing. God saves. God saves. So just ask to be saved. That's, that's what he's saying. That's, and everyone just complicates things. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. 
There's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the point is, he's, he's not criticizing Moses. He's not criticizing the law of God. He, he's actually saying, you don't understand Moses. It's not like everyone understood Moses correctly and everyone understood the Old Testament correctly for 1,400 years and then Jesus came and then, and then they're like, oh, okay, we, we, we understood everything correctly. But Je Jesus is like, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And, and what Jesus said was, hey, everybody, Pharisees, you're not the heroes. You need a hero. You can't save yourselves. And that's why they crucified him because he's like, you're all sinners. You can't save yourselves. You're not the author, et cetera, et cetera. What Paul is saying is we've misread Paul. Uh, we've misread Moses because we've read Moses to think that we could do it, that we could actually save ourselves, justify ourselves. St. Paul isn't saying that Moses' ministry was wrong and mine's right. He's saying, I was just more fortunate. We preached the same message. I just got more of the Holy Spirit. God just finally got to a point where he's like, they can't save themselves. I'm going to set, I'm going to do it for them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thus the day of Pentecost where the author of life sends life, the Holy Spirit. He's saying uh, the message was the same, that only God saves, love him with everything. I just got a little more revelation in the Holy Spirit uh, saved people. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says, For if, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if anyone receive, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. This is the same thing he did with Galatians. This is the same thing he did us everywhere. Where he preached the gospel. How are you saved? Only by grace through faith. It's only faith. Trusting in Jesus Christ. Teachers would come in from the old covenant. They're like, yeah, but you need laws. You need ceremonial laws. And they begin to add things to salvation. St. Paul does this with absolutely all of the churches. And all that he says is no Look to, to the scripture. Look what it says. It says that we can't save ourselves. We're not the hero. God is the author. We are not. So we need to ask him to save us. And we need to ask him to free us. And that's point number three, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 14. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. The old covenant, that phrase here, it's the only time it's mentioned in Scripture. And it's mentioned to describe unbelieving Jews who thought, we, we are God's chosen people. We are the hero. And we can do it. We can free ourselves. And what's fascinating is Israel, even now, Israel looks back to their time in the wilderness as their golden age, as the summit of their history. Like this God led us out of captivity and this is the pinnacle of our history. When if you read the scriptures, it's absolutely clear. God intended to bring them into the promised land much sooner than he did. And they were punished for their lack of faith. God saved them with miracles from the hand of the Egyptians. And then God says, go into the promised land. They're like, no, there's giants. God's like, all right, I took you out of Egypt. Now I got to take Egypt out of you. And for 40 years, all they did was wander the desert until that whole generation died. They all died. And God's like to the kids, do you now believe? And they're like, yeah, we finally believe. And then they go into the promised land led by Joshua and Caleb. But they thought that, God, you expect us to save ourselves and God's like, that burden of responsibility, I didn't place on you. I'm going to save you. I'm going with you. I freed you once. Now I want to free you from the responsibility of thinking that you have to free yourself. Jesus is the one that frees. St. Paul isn't talking about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The difference between I can and I can't. So the point, the point, the Old Covenant isn't, isn't, before Christ in time, and the new covenant is in the year of our Lord, A.D. The old covenant is, it was then, and it is now. 
The old covenant was then and is now. There's people today who are in the old covenant, the old way of thinking that you can save yourself, that you can commend yourself to God in some way, that you have done so much good or that you have suffered so much, and that's why God should have a relationship with you. That uh, God, look at everything I've done. Look, look at everything I did for you. And God's like, that's the old way of thinking, new covenant, the true covenant. Abraham was in the old covenant and the new covenant. Moses, did he believe in the old covenant way or the new covenant way? David, when he sinned, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Why didn't God smite him right there? Because he was old covenant. You, why? Because he repented. He said, God, I can't save myself. Psalm, Psalm 52, God, I can't. Please wash me. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Die. The, the contrast between old is new isn't the contrast between Moses' epoch and Jesus' epoch. It's the, it's, the, it's the difference between the old man and the new man. I had a barber named Joe. I didn't, I didn't know his last name until like years after because I only called him Joe the Barber. And Joe the Barber in Cranston, Rhode Island, he's the one, he was Pentecostal. And I remember in eighth grade, he turns me around in his barber chair and he smacks me in the forehead because he's Pentecostal. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I prophesy that you are going to be a minister of the gospel. And then he just turned me around and kept cutting my hair. <laughs> oh, oh, that's why. We're... So Joe Canastracci had a joke. He told me this joke one time. He said, did you know that St. Paul, like his dad actually talked to Jesus? I was like, oh, no way. He said, did you know yeah, not only that, but his dad was actually crucified next to Jesus Christ. I said, where'd you get that? Extra canonical, some kind of Pentecostal, maybe have some kind of different revelation. I was like, where'd you get that? And he's like, I got that from the Bible. I'm like, you get the Bible? He's like, yeah, where it says, where St. Paul says, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> That's what St. Paul's talking about. My old man, my old flesh, old covenant, new covenant, old man, new man. That's what he's talking about here. The old way of relating to God, thinking that you can do something to ingratiate yourself with God. And, and that's the old The new way is, God save me. That's it. St. Paul here is saying the old covenant is relying on yourself. The new covenant is just relying on Jesus Christ. That's the word for us today in Boston. That's the word for us. Have you noticed that you can talk about with your friends here, you can talk about absolutely any religion except one you notice that any religion any faith buddhism confucianism islam you could have a quran bible study and people would come but as soon as you say hey you want to come to my house and talk about jesus everyone gets weirded out why why Jesus is the only one that tells everyone, hey, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you are nobody. Apart from me, you deserve condemnation. There's only one way to God. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, but the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So he's not saying letter is the Old Testament religion or the spirit is the New Testament spiritually gracious. Because St. Paul says the, the law is actually how I came to faith. That's Romans 7. The law brings knowledge of sin. You read the Ten Commandments and you're like, I've broken every single one of these, at least in thought on the heart level. And Jesus said, if you committed the sin in your heart, you committed the sin in real life. So the ministry of the law actually has a ministry. So he's not saying there's anything inherently wrong with the law. What he's saying is when you divorce the word from the spirit, when you divorce the word from the spirit, you lose absolutely everything. Because God says behind every single word in the Holy Scriptures is the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God wrote it. So if you just focus on the letter of the law instead of asking for the Holy Spirit to show you the spiritual dimension of the Holy Word, then you actually misread absolutely everything. There's one way to read the whole Bible, and that's I can do this. The new way to read the Bible is you read the whole thing. is I can't do it. Jesus did it. And now by the power of the Spirit, I can do it. 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses has read, a veil lies over their hearts. 
But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed to the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This whole chapter is a commentary on Exodus 32 through 34, and I commend that you read that. I was tempted to read the whole thing today because I do that sometimes. Just read that on your own. You know how to read. So in Exodus 32 through 34, it's the account of God's response to Israel's breaking the promise to keep the law. So at Sinai in Exodus 24, God says, here's my law. Here's what I expect from you. The blessing is before you and the curse. And twice, you know what they say? (laughs) This is, they say, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. You, you know that the meme of the lady was like, you know that one? Like that's literally right there. Where you're like, yeah, we're going to be obedient. And, and right away they commit sins. Moses goes up to Sinai to meet with God to get the Ten Commandments that God inscribed with his own finger. He, he, Moses is met with God. He sees the glory of God. He comes down the mountain and he hears a party. They're throwing a party in which they're worshiping a, they're worshiping a golden statue that Aaron made. God, we're going to worship you. Oh, Moses left. Okay, let's throw a party. And then Moses, what he takes the Ten Commandments, he smashes them at the foot of the mountain. And it was a sin so bad that God's like, all right, I'm done with them. I'm going to wipe all of them out. And I'm going to start a new Israel through you, Moses. And Moses is like, I'm pretty old. I don't want any more kids. And God's like, all right. And then Moses is like, I'm going to intercede for them. And he intercedes and God finally forgives them. But this is what happened. God withdrew his presence. God withdrew his presence. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't do what you were going to say, so I'm leaving. God withdrew his presence. They rejected the spirit of God. If, and God says, if for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. But Moses begs him, he says, please, God, don't leave. Please stay with us. So Moses pitches him a tent of meeting outside the camp, far off from the camp. And in the tent of meeting, a pillar of cloud would rise over the entrance. And Moses spoke to God. So Moses intercedes, asks for God's presence. God, God says, okay, fine. And then he goes up the mountain again, and Moses cuts two new stone tablets, ascends Sinai again, and the Lord descended in a cloud, and this is where the Lord hid Moses in a cleft. The rock of age is cleft for me. Moses is in that cleft. And Moses said, please, God, give me a glimpse of your glory. I just want to see a glimpse. I want to see if it's all worth it. All the sacrifices I've ever, I want to see if it's all worth it. And God passes through and gives him his afterglow that just a little piece and then Moses descends from the from from the mountain and his face is glowing that's the story and this is Exodus 34 29 35 when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony in his hand and he came down from the mountain Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking to God Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him but Moses called to him and Aaron and all the leaders in the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the people of Israel what he commanded. The people of Israel would see the face of Moses. The skin of Moses' face was shining, and the and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with them. What's what's going on here? What's going on here is Moses is like, I meet with God. And while I proclaim the, glo- the word of God, the glory of God, okay, you see it. But I have to cover it. Because if I don't, all of you are going to die. Because you sinned against God. That's why he had to cover it. In 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 13, Paul says, Since we have such a hope, we're very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So is he saying that Moses wasn't bold? No. So the the whole term bold comes from the Aramaic. Bold is you show your face. Shameful is you cover your face. He says, we are bold. That's what the word bold means because we do not have our shame. Our shame has been removed. 
But Moses would cover his face, not to cover his own shame. He would cover his face because the people of God had sinned against God and he was doing it to protect them because they couldn't handle the glory of God. And that's what he says in verse 15. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So it's over their hearts, not their minds. So when people don't believe in God, they, it's not because of intellect, it's because of the heart. It's because moral reasons. Their heart is covered with this veil of shame. And when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now there's freedom because there's no shame. Yes, I have sinned against the holy God. Yes, I have fallen short of the glory of God. I deserve to be destroyed because I have sinned against God. But St. Paul says we are confident. We can draw near to the throne of grace because Jesus Christ removed the veil of shame. When did he do that? So when Jesus Christ, remember he was the glorious son of God, transfiguration, his face shone. And then that same Jesus goes to the cross the most glorious one takes on the most shame. And on the cross, he is shrouded with the condemnation of God because he took our sin upon himself. So now, because Jesus was killed instead of us, he bore our shame to give us a glimpse of his glory. We can approach the throne of grace with boldness and turn to the Lord who removes the veil. I, I meet people like this. Some people are, there's two categories. One of the categories people are like, I don't need God. I'm a good person. And the other category of people is, I have done so much evil. I can't come to church because God's going to strike me with lightning. Just turn to the Lord. Whoever turns to the Lord, he removes the veil. Because Jesus Christ on the cross, he died, he was crucified, and the curtain that protected us from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. Years later, Jesus Christ took up in the final hours of his life, he held up a cup at Passover, and he said, this cup is poured out for you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So how are we transformed? from one degree of glory to another, we behold the cross, the Son of Man, Son of God, on the cross. In conclusion, is Christ's handwriting evident in your life? If someone took your life, the story of your life, would that story pass the handwriting analysis that this story was written by the Son of God and the Spirit of God? And here's the test. Here's the test. In whom do you trust Period. And whom do you trust? St. Paul in Philippians 3, he says, look, if, if we're going to play this game about confidence in the flesh, he said, I, I could beat all of you. This is Philippians 3. You can just, I'm not going to read it. But Philippians 3, I was righteous. 